Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Rock. In this message, I pray that you would guide me. I pray that you would open all of our ears, our souls, to your word, so that we stand firm on the promises of Christ Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Bless us during this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In April of 2021, the Finnish prosecutor general, the prosecutor for the country of Finland, announced that three separate charges of incitement against a minority group were, be, were filed against a Finnish member of parliament, and her name is Pavi Rasanen. The charges fell under a chapter of Finnish law which criminalizes war crimes and crimes against humanity, and each charge can result in a prison sentence of up to two years. So the question is, what were her crimes? Well, in 2004, 17 years earlier, she had written a pamphlet that said marriage is between a man and a woman and was critical of homosexuality. And then in 2019, she was on a radio program in which she criticized the state Lutheran church for participating in a gay pride parade and also for tweeting a Bible verse from Romans, just a picture of the Bible verse. For those, she was incited for crimes against humanity. Thankfully, a court in Helsinki acquitted her of all charges. Now, this past December, December 2022, in England, a woman was arrested outside an abortion clinic. She was not protesting. She was not holding a sign. She was not even saying anything out loud. And the abortion clinic was closed. So what was her crime? Praying silently in her head. And as you know, last year in Scottsdale, there was a satanic convention, SatanCon. And now this year, April 28th through the 30th, the Satanic Temple is hosting SatanCon 2023 in Boston, and they are billing it as the largest satanic convention yet. These are but three examples in the news out of the many that I could have picked from. And there's a spiritual battle going on, and you can't miss it even if you have a, but a little bit of spiritual discernment. There's a darkness and hatred against Christianity stronger than ever before for a long, long time. And Satan isn't even hiding. Really, a Satan convention. And the thing is, Satan isn't just out there, but Satan is in the churches as well. And how do we know this? Well, we see a weakening of people actually knowing Scripture, of knowledge and discernment by God's Word. We see a weakening of spiritual fortitude, a courage of our convictions, and most of all, I think Satan is at work with this one word, apathy. In much of the Western church, so Europe, United States, apathy reigns in many, many churches. And how do you know that apathy reigns? Well, people say, geez, it's raining today. Do I have to go to church? Right? Do I have to go to church? It's early. Oh, I had a long week. Couldn't I just skip it today? It goes so long. Couldn't we shorten it to like a half hour? Why do we have to go so long? Right? All of these things are an indication of apathy. When church becomes one more thing to do, 
it becomes rote or a dead obligation. And in many churches across Europe, across the United States, there are a lot of dead people in the churches. This is the work of Satan. This is the spiritual battle. Now, I don't say any of this to make you disgusted, to make you fearful, to get you angry even. This is simply a black and white view of the spiritual battle that's going on. And yet, you and I are people of the light, right? We are people of eternal hope. You see, we are a body of Christ the King. The one who suffered, died, and rose again. And thus this picture is the one that I chose for this whole series, God's Church for a time such as this. Because it shows the promises that we have no matter the darkness in the world, no matter the spiritual battles that are being taking place outside and inside the church. See, you and I are called this very day to be the church, to do the work of ministry together. And we must acknowledge that God has put you and me here in this time, in this place, for the work, for a time such as this. I do not believe it is any... Con any uh, coincidence that you are here today. I mean, you didn't get here by accident today, did you? Right? It's raining out for goodness sake. You came here on purpose, and for those who are listening at home or hearing this afterwards, I believe that it is no coincidence you are here for this message today. Because you and I are called for a time such as this. You and I are are called to be God's church for a time such as this. Not a lukewarm church, not a fearful church, not a church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, but a time to be called out as God's people for the work, for the ministry to do. You and I are called to a higher calling. So in this series, we're going to dig in like we haven't dug in before. And it's going to be instructive. It is going to be encouraging, and make no mistake, it will be challenging as well. Today, we're going to lay the foundation, and the foundation is Christ, the solid rock. And then we're going to be building upon that foundation throughout this entire series. And so this morning, I need you to really sit up in your soul. And if you are at home, sit up in your soul this very moment and hear the word of the Lord of Christ Jesus, who is the foundation, who is the solid rock. And this morning, we will take a look at three things. We will take a look at the confession we are to have, the foundation, and ultimately the promise we have in Christ Jesus. You ready? Buckle up. Here we go. Matthew chapter 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others said Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, most people are at least familiar with this passage of Scripture. And in this passage of Scripture, Jesus asks one of the most penetrating questions he could ever ask because it gets to the heart of the matter. Who do you say that I am? Look, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about Jesus. You know, just like the disciples said, well, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, maybe another prophet. People in nowadays will also say something, well, uh, Jesus was a good teacher, he was a, a wise man, and they'll go on about Jesus. 
when I was praying yesterday with some of uh, two women uh, in their cars, they were waiting for food at Desert Manna, one woman said, well, you know, it's a lot of folklore, isn't it? Just people's interpretation of who Jesus is and all of that. But Jesus isn't asking about him. He's saying, who do you say that I am? He doesn't want your philosophy. He doesn't want your feelings about it. Who do you say that I am? He doesn't care about your Uncle George, your Aunt Mary say about him. If Jesus stands before you, there's that one question, who do you say that I am? And you have to come face to face with that question in your life. What is your confession to Jesus? What is your confession? You see, Peter makes a very, very clear confession, and he does not waffle or hem whatsoever. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice, very carefully, Peter does not say, you are one of the Christs. You are one of the living God. You are, you are not a Christ, you are not a son of the living God. You are the son, the Christ of the living God. So his confession declares the uniqueness of who Jesus is. There's no waffling. There's no doubt here. Now, in a statement that contains just ten words, In a literal sense, it would be, you are the Christ, the Son of the God of the living. For reasons in English, we smooth that out. But what does that mean to say you are the Christ? To say that you are the Christ means that he is the long-awaited anointed one. The mediator between God and man. The The one who the Father anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the eternal priest. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's what it means to say you are the Christ. It is not a little word that means nothing. It has full impact. And when he says you are the Son of the living God, One commentator put it like this, it can mean no less than that in a unique sense, a sense not applicable to any mortal Jesus was and is and always will be the Son of God. And the Son of God is God. He is God in the flesh. We just talk about this, right? All of Advent and in Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. And he is the Son of the living God. Not a dead God. Not a dead God like the idols and pagans, the pagan idols that people would pray to, but a God who lives and lives forevermore. This is the confession that Peter gives. Would that be your confession? See, look, Paul enlarged this for us in his letter to the Colossians. He said, he, Jesus, is the image, the exact representation of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together." That's what Peter was confessing. And it is a line of demarcation. It's a line in the sand. And there's no turning back from his confession. And with his confession comes a changed life. A life that says, I will live for you, Jesus. Imperfectly, yes. 
needing to be corrected? Yes. Just like the rest of us. Yes. But it is a line in the sand. That's the confession. And most people don't have that confession nowadays. Most people say, well, you know, if you ask them, well, what do you believe? People might confess, well, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Baptist, I'm, I'm a Catholic, I'm a what, fill in the blank, right? But is that the confession we are to have? No. We are to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. People's confession is weak because they aren't confessing Christ. And when you really confess Christ and it sinks in your bones and fills your soul, there's a line in the sand. No turning back, no turning back. So, how does Jesus reply to Peter's confession? Then Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Bar which just means son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus didn't say, good for you, Peter, you figured it out. You've done all your homework, you put all the pieces together, you used that intellect even as rock hard as you are, and you figured it out. He didn't do that, did he? Where did that insight and faith come from? The Father. It is the Father. And so we talk about that faith in and of itself is a gift from God so that no man can boast. This is what it says in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, so now we've got the confession, right? And that it comes from God himself. And now we take a look at Jesus, who is both the foundation and then the promise as well. He says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Okay. There are a lot of interpretations regarding this one verse. And specifically, the Roman Catholic Church uses this verse to say that Peter is the first pope. Now, there are a lot of interpretations that do come into play regarding this particular verse. As you can see on screen, Peter is Petros, rock, in a male uh, form of the word. And this rock is Petra, and that's a feminine version of the word. So you can see there's a little bit of wordplay, right? Well, let me just briefly give you some of the interpretations. The rock may refer to Jesus. It may refer to Peter as a leader, Peter as a representative of the church, or the church in general. So there's four. Let me give you a fifth now, too. So where they were standing, and we'll get this into this a little bit later, where they were standing was generally considered to be the gateway to the underworld, right? For Satan and the... And the devil and all of his demons. And so he's declaring that on this rock, right here in front of the gates, the church will overcome evil and death. How's that? There you got your, your primer on all of those interpretations. And while I don't agree with the Roman Catholic Church on this, uh, on their interpretation, that's not my intent here. And I don't think it should be the intent of what Jesus said either because I think we miss the forest, the, the tree from the forest. Which one is that? I can't even get that out. I think we missed the point. Okay? And apparently I can't even get the point, so let's go with it. Here's the point. Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, Peter, you're going to build your church. He didn't tell the disciples, you're going to build your church. He said, I will build my church. And that's the point. That's the point of the whole verse here. I will build my church. And thus, Jesus is saying he is both the architect 
and the foundation for his church. Listen from our reading from Ephesians. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of, all, of him who fills all in all. He's the head, he's the foundation, and as you know from Scripture, he is the rock, he is the cornerstone by which everything is squared up. He's that one foundation. And upon him, he will build his church. Now you have to know, in Scripture, this is the first time the word church is used. And most people don't know what church means. So we're going to explore that a little bit because it's important. We have generally made church into a very passive word. What are you going to do this morning? I'm going to go to church, right? That's what we do. But church is not a passive word. It actually comes from this word ecclesia, Sometimes it's spelled with C's rather than K's. Ecclesia. And if you break that word down, it mean, there's ek and kaleo. Ek means out of or out from. And kaleo means called or summoned. So you could say, what is the church? The people who have been called out by God. Let that sink in. You. And if we had time, I would mention every one of your names, first name, you have been called out by God here this day. What were you called out from? And you have to be able to answer that too. He called you from death to life. He called you out from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom. He called you out from impure living to a holy living. And ultimately, he called you through the gospel. You here this day, God has called out. And he has called you by name. And we together, you and me, we are called out, and that's the church. And that has a whole other implication of what it means to live. To live for Christ. To be the called out ones in a time such as this. And the church that Jesus is speaking about is not just joy church either. It is the church universal. So we get really myopic when we talk about church and we focus on our church, Joy Church. There was even one person who's no longer here who didn't want to do evangelism unless they came to Joy Church. So I'm not going to share the gospel unless they come to our church. Do you hear that? And that's the state for many churches. We should rejoice anytime anybody comes to saving faith. And if they go to a Bible-based, Christ-centered, gospel-centered church, amen. We are not, listen carefully, we are not in competition with other churches that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and gospel-centered. The churches in the ministerial in this town, we are not in competition for them. If somebody goes, you know, they, they come to faith, and then they go to Trinity Lutheran or Cornerstone or Scottsdale Bible Fountain Hills, we rejoice just as they rejoice when people come here because this is a kingdom focus, the universal church. And so you and I, in a time such as this, need to stand for the church universal. And where there is no waffling on the confession, where there's no waffling on who Jesus is. 
the foundation. He's going to build his church. And he has a promise that we need to hold on to. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's interesting to note, when Jesus was speaking, they would have been at Caesarea Philippi. And it's possible that they could have been at the base of Mount Hermon. At the base of Mount Hermon is one of the largest springs that feeds the Jordan River. So there could have been a place for them to sit, to talk, for him to preach and teach. But I want to show you a picture because there's more at the base of Mount Hermon. So, in the red circle, you can see that's where Jesus and the disciples might have been. But what's surrounding that area? Well, first of all, there's a temple uh, of Augustus. So there's a temple to Caesar, Caesar Augustus. There's a temple of Pan. Pan was the half man, half goat. He was the one who played that wooden flute. Okay? So you've got the temple of Pan. There's a pagan god. And also a temple of Augustus. That's also idolatry. A temple of Zeus a temple of the sacred goat, and a temple of the dancing goat. And by the way, isn't it interesting that goat shows up in three of these temples? And so I, I don't want to press this too hard, but there seems to be more of a difference when Jesus says, I'm going to separate the sheep and the goats. So now, Jesus is there, right? Right? And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice Jesus did not go far away in seclusion. <laughs> hey, Peter, Paul, the, the, the you know, uh, sorry, Peter, James, John, all the disciples, we're going to do an off-site here. And we're going to talk about the promises I'm going to give you. No, he was right there. And even if they weren't right there, they would have known about the gates to this underworld. And so Jesus stands in the midst of that darkness and he proclaims a promise. The gates of hell shall not overcome it, shall not prevail against it. Now, does that mean that all churches and all people will always stand strong? Doesn't, does it? We take a look at what's currently going on. We take a look at history, and there are churches, there are people who fall away. And by the way, this is not a new phenomenon. Just read, read the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and 3, and you will see churches that have fallen away from Christ Jesus. So there are churches, there are people who will fall away, and we know have fallen away. Does this mean that the promise of Christ has failed? And the answer is no. But here's what happens. When Jesus, his cross and gospel, stop being the center of your faith, or you change the meaning of the cross and the gospel, you stop being the church, and you lose the promise. See, rather than teaching and preaching God's word, Rather than lifting high the cross, proclaiming Christ, churches will start preaching and teaching about inclusivity, about diversity, about equality, about social justice, and everything else except the gospel. And when you fill people with that, you lose all sight of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the wrath of God against all sin. And thus, you lose any meaning of Jesus, his cross and resurrection. And without his cross and resurrection, do you know what you end up worshiping? You don't worship the creator. You worship the creator, the creation, the creature. Without Christ and his cross and resurrection, we ended up worshiping and serving the creature, rather the creator. 
This is why Paul was so hard on churches in Corinth and to the churches in the area of Galatia or to the Galatians. He pounded on them in a way that wasn't nice. Listen to what he said to to the Galatians. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is a different gospel, but there are some of you who trouble some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That is, let him be damned. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. We have many warnings like this in Scripture. And it's really easy to get this pounded so far down into you that you lose who you are and you lose the promise of who you are. You and I together, we are children of the light. We are children of the promises. And the promises rest not on us. Thank God for that, right? Amen. The promises don't rest on us. They rest on him who made the promises. The promise rests not on how strong we are, but on how holy, righteous, and powerful, and mighty Jesus is. It rests on his cross and resurrection. And thus have that picture ingrained in your mind as you go further following Christ Jesus. He is our rock. He is our redeemer. Peter said this, This is Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which among men by which we must be saved. And then in Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. So let those promises sink into your soul. Listen, there is no one else under heaven, no other name by which you are saved. Christ Jesus, he is the first and the last. He is the living one and evermore and he's the one who has the power over death, over hell itself. You and I are called for a time such as this. We are called out by God for this time. And so, brothers and sisters, we together need to dig deep and hold fast. Hold fast to your confession. If you've really never made a confession of Christ, Today, let that be the day. Hold fast. Dig deep to that. Stand firm on the foundation of Christ Jesus. And hold fast to the promises that he and he alone fulfills. I'm going to end here with Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.